Welcome. I'm Alfred Lamont Weber, and we're with author Sheldon Moore, author of Remember Zen. And this is part two of a three part and perhaps even more parts if it uh, if it needs to go. Uh, you remember in in a part one, we uh, discussed how the dual suns, which you see there, were in a two sun solar system affect consciousness as you know the suns are farther apart and when they come closer together and uh uh sheldon in this part two will be discussing our connection to the yuga cycles both the exopolitics of the yuga cycles each yuga being uh he'll he'll discuss that the exopolitics, that is, uh, all the different races that will be uh, coming, and also the spiritual aspects of it, and as well, the astronomy of enlightenment. So, uh, Sheldon, over to you. Well, thanks again for having me. Um, so, I was just going to um, go through, a, maybe spend about four or five minutes discussing what we talked about last time, so somebody that's watching the second series they don't see the first series, they can kind of get the gist of where we're at. And um, one of the things that I proposed last time was this alternative yuga theory that was um, really brought up to the world's attention by um, a great Kriya yoga master named Sri Yakteswar. He was an Indian sage, quite contemporary, lived in, I think he passed away in 1936. And he proposed this alternative yuga theory and he didn't just sort of pull this, this came out of scriptural knowledge. So it wasn't his, his theory. And it was about the, the, it's called the laws of Manu. And a lot of people don't know who this Manu is in Vedic um, history, but um, he's a guy who built, saved the world when a flood came, built an ark, got some animals on an ark. And we've all heard that story before, but it's in very vague terms in uh, sort of uh, Christian and, and Jewish literature compared to what is discussed about the Manu in uh, Vedic literature. So I kind of think this Manu and Noah are potentially the same same person. And um, so some of this history could potentially be real. But what comes with this um, laws of Manu is this theory that um, we're on a 24,000 year cycle with the dual sun. It's like it's another star out there that our sun interacts with. And that's really what's causing this rising and falling of consciousness within the yuga cycles. And it makes a lot of sense because currently a lot of uh, Vedic astrologers will tell you it's actually tied to a Maha Yuga of 4.32 million years, which is a very long time. And if that was the case, we literally have 427,000 more years, the dark ages. And Shri Tishra knew this. I kind of know this in my own gut that that's not the case. And there was actually a different... Uh, yuga cycle theory and it's tied to a great year or a procession of the equinox is 24,000 year cycle now with supercomputers we've uh, determined that it's a 25,800 year cycle but we were basing that on what we we're um, extrapolating out based on the procession of the equinox which truly is caused by the moon spinning around our earth that's what they thought it was where you get that slow 24,000 year wobble well, it kind of got turned upside down. I guess it was kind of the late 1990s. Two Caltech researchers said that we have this planetary object, a ninth planet all of a sudden, lurking out there. They didn't find it with a telescope, but they noticed that the outer planets of our solar system had this uh, perturbation in the outer orbits, and they didn't have uh, moons big enough to cause this. So they were kind of wondering what, what was causing this. And they came up that we have a... Um, there's a ninth planet, they call it. They even had it on the mainstream media and it quickly got washed away and kind of put down and nobody really talks about it anymore. But what's interesting about that research is they noticed something and they actually made calculations and they've got this, they call it a planet, but it doesn't go around the sun like a typical planet in a nice circular orbit. It comes in like a binary, it comes in and then goes out kind of like a comet's path would be, but it's more kind of like an L-shaped type of orbit. So, and they give it about a 15,000 year orbit. So every 15,000 years, they're saying that this comes in. So the reason why I think that this, this Kriya Yogmaster and the Vedic stuff is probably uh, 
uh, more accurate than this 15,000 years that our scientists have recently come up with is, first of all, they're kind of the first ones that even saw this. And what I'm telling you about right now is um, in ancient scriptures. And I think that it might have came from somewhere else. Because if you think about a 24,000 year, or even if you want to call it 25,000 year cycle, if some ancient race is actually measuring that cycle and, and knows when each yuga comes, you know how the ratios I told you about, there's a 4, 3, 2, 1 ratio. So the golden age is 10,000 years in this almost, and then the dark age is only a 2,400 year period. To be able to measure that, you have you would have to at least experience that five, six times, and then record that history for 24,000 years. And we, I don't think we've really been doing that on this planet. We haven't recorded that history of a cycle for so long. And if it was actually a Maha Yuga of 4.32 uh, million years, definitely it had to come from somewhere else. Because how do, how do you record something for so long and then see those cycles? And I would believe that a, an advanced race that came from somewhere else would probably have that knowledge that binary star systems really do help conscious, um, evolve, consciousness evolve. Because as these two stars come together, now, if you want to believe the electric universe, a star is just charged plasma, um, basically. So as you get two big bodies coming together that are charged plasma, you don't think that the life force, the sentient life force, is going to be affected by that magnetics and um, electric fields? It would be. And it's a positive thing. So in this model, the Sita Vishnu Yabi, or, or the Sita Brahman, occurs when these two stars come right together. And if you look back at our history, Roughly, if you look at the way this, we'll go back and talk about it a bit um, later, but exactly in 11,500 BC is when Atlantis fell, if you look at this model, because that's when the two stars were the exact, the closest possible. They were in basically perihelion at that point. And, and that fits our history. And maybe the, the flood actually happened at that period as well, because of, like the biblical flood or this flood of the Manu that got these animals on an ark as well. You know, two people building an ark, it's kind of, I think a lot of these ancient stories are drawn down into all religions, and there's a bigger connection there than we think. And um, so like a 24,000 year period is very hard to measure, so it had to come from somewhere else. And we were taught that by somebody else. I, I really believe that. And when I, why I kind of believe that is, and we'll talk about this later again, but in the, in, in Vedic literature, they talk about things called the manas, and these are flying machines. And they mentioned four types of manas. Um, two are continental, so they fly within a continent. One is intercontinental, and one is interplanetary. And these, some of these guys have blue skin, and they're, we're talking about interplanetary. You know, I don't think this is science fiction. I think this was real, and, and this really happened in our past. And... Um, this information goes way back because you you would have to to be able to monitor a long cycle like that you would have to be an ancient race and we just don't have the history of um, recording history that well once we get into a dark age our history gets all turned upside down and, and um, there's usually cataclysms when these two stars come together because um, you know like you could have a pole shift the other star could uh, um, there could be debris going through the planetary system but it's, it's not really an age of cataclysm because the golden age in this model lasts um, for, for um, 9,600 years, almost 10,000 years, you get a golden age. So it's probably only a period of, of maybe four or 500 years where things get really bad, where this thing comes in and there's really severe earth changes, maybe a pole shift. And they're starting to realize this about the ice age, which also goes back about this exact same time. You know, you go back 13,500 years ago is when this all happened. And um, what would happen is if you had a slight pole shift, all of a sudden those ice caps are in two different places where it's warm and they would melt very quickly. So you'd have a very rapid melt and where the new poles are, they would start to form ice and the new, but it, there's a, probably a 500 year, maybe a thousand year period of that transition, right? So you would have a great flood and then you would have it kind of go back, it would balance out. The earth always balances itself out again and that's just how nature works. That's how the multiverse works. That's how a binary star system works. Everything works that way. It's, it's kind of marvelous when you sort of see it all kind of working. And um, so if you were an explorer, an advanced race exploring the multiverse, you might want to look at binary star systems before you look at single, because the, the evolution of consciousness may be more rapid. 
you might have a better chance of finding a, a, an advanced race on a, on a binary system than you would on a single system. It may not be the case. It may, may be even better. You don't know. Uh, um, we we'll, we'll won't find that out for a long time yet. But um, so that's kind of um, what this theory was. And, and as they reach the furthest point, or what they call aphelion, consciousness falls and we have a dark age. And on this model that I'm going to show you in a minute, we reached that period in 500 um, AD. And so a lot of people think of the Dark Age, they think of the European Dark Age, but there's more to the Dark Age. Before 500 AD, there was wars in China, there was dark the Persian Wars, so many wars. I did a, some research for you between the, the, the actual Dark Age on this model. We had um, two, over 2,000 wars. These weren't different battles. These were actually wars on this planet. So... And the reason that happens is you see these, these two stars are further apart. And um, if you believe in the electric universe and how it affects your soul, that's when um, the magnetism and the electrics are, are the furthest apart. So you don't have a golden age, you have a dark age. But it's only for a very short period. Um, the golden age is much longer. So I changed this model a little bit just to let the viewers to sort of see it. So. If you can see my cursor, if you go right to the top here, where the near where it says nearest point, can you see that? Yes. Yeah, that in the past at the, was um, eleven thousand five hundred BC, so before Christ. Now we're going to talk about another site, uh, one of these arithmetic calculators. It's uh, called Galepitep that they found in Turkey. That's exactly about twelve thousand years old, and it was buried by tiny stones. So whoever built this, this ground calculator, um, they buried it right around the time of this collapse when these two stars came together, because it's roughly 12,000 years old, this, this site. And you have to ask, why did they bury it? Because it would have probably got damaged when the pole shift happened. And I think they buried it for future generations to find. And we could figure out what they really use these sites for because they're all over the world. And hopefully by the end of the day, everybody that's watching this program is going to know what most of these sites are actually used for. So you can see at the top here, you get quite a long golden age. You see this yellow goldish band I drew, drew here? There's actually, that's, there's two arcs. There's a 4,800 on the ascending part and a 4,800 year on the descending part. Because remember I said that these are electric arcs. On the, on the, they're 12,000 years each. One's descending where things get worse and worse and worse. And on the ascending, things get better and better and better. Kind of things start to drop. So <clears throat> this is right when Atlantis fell. And our ice age kind of fits this. They used to say the ice age lasted thousands, tens of thousands of years. Now they're talking about a fast thaw and a fast melt. Kind of fits with what I just told you about how this might have played out. And I think when we're in this golden age, because... um. Sorry, this uh, thing keeps coming out. When we're in this golden age up here, that these two stars, as I told you before, the electrics change, right? So as they start coming back together, I think that there might potentially, and this is not in any scripture, this is just me talking now, um, bringing some actual politics into this, but I really believe this is what's occurring based on if you really look at our history. Everybody knows the golden age when, you did, when it was described like what Plato, it was kind of this wonderful place. It wasn't it was an enlightened society, advanced technology. You know, things were pretty good when you read about this in our past. And we don't have a lot of information about what really occurred in this golden age. But we were at our best then. Like, when you have an enlightened society, you have better art, you have better music, you have better scientists, you have better writers, you have better people baking bread. Everything's kind of better in a golden age. Because the electrics are different when these, these, these two stars are together our soul consciousness is affected by is affected by electrics so it's more positive so when these stars come together you get this very long 9600 year period of golden age, of a golden age um, but as you descend on this arc then you get into the next yuga because this is the satwa yuga which is golden age that yellow band the next yuga on this model is tetra yuga and that's still higher mental age. So that's like a, um, things, you know, there's enlightened societies, things are, we're still in a, in a good point at that point. And when we went through this last time, right about here is where Rama, tur uh, Rama turned up. And one of your viewers asked about how 
do these different races fit in this? How do the Anunnaki potentially fit into this 24,000 year model? Because um, we start looking at times and it seems to go back way, way further than 24,000 years. And I think what's interesting is if you read the Mahabharata, there was actually wars in space. Like they were flying these Vimanas and Krishna in the Dwarka Yuga actually told people to leave Dwarka that the city was going to sink. It would get out of town sort of thing. And there was um, uh, people that are, they were being attacked from space basically. And, and right around that time between Krishna and Rama, because Rama was um, 5,000 BC and Krishna was uh, 3,100 BC. Um, the Sumerian tablets that talk about these Anunnaki started to appear, but they really talking about something that happened maybe 200,000 years before that. So you got to go around this, this thing back 200,000 years to where, you know, and we're starting to find uh, gold mining sites in Africa and stuff that really fits that, that there was somebody here a long, long time ago and they were, they had advanced technology and they were looking for gold. So there's a lot of people think, well, were we created, were we spliced? Because if you start going back into those time frames, only you know, only 30,000 years ago on planet Earth, 40,000 years ago, there was Neanderthals, there was Homo sapiens, which were our ancestors, and there was uh, Denisovans, three different groups on this planet. And they all had the same kind of anatomy almost as you and I have. So they would have, the, they were in soul beings and they would have probably had the potential even to be enlightened and they live more closer with nature, so they might have been more enlightened ones back then. But some of those ancient groups have been here for a long time, like the Australian Aborigines. They thought they were only 40,000 years, and they're now the same 80,000 years. So we have one group of people on the planet right now that had 80,000 years. They went around this wheel almost four times now. And, and so whoever was coming in kind of left a lot of groups alone. There wasn't as much... Um, control as people like to, to say there was and what was interesting in the golden age in the time of Rama where they're flying the manas they had and there's people with blue skin it appears that we're in our golden age where when this, these two suns are getting closer together I think there's a dimensional change and we get into the fifth and and as we're in the dark age when you come out of a dark age you slowly go into the fourth and then you slowly go into the fifth you stay in the fifth throughout the whole golden age come out of it and these cycles of time this is the rising and the falling of consciousness and it's kind of an amazing thing about our ability as our, our physical bodies you know there might have been some genetic manipulation in the past it doesn't matter we're able to go through all of this these cycles we are physically we can live through all of these cycles and these different um these different dimensions because there is there i really believe there's a shift that occurs as these suns come together and then it changes as you go out so the interesting thing is right around the time of Rama, we start having these um, uh, Stonehenge-like devices. One's in the Nevada Playa. There's Armenian Stonehenge. They found a similar one in Canada and Alberta. That's not, it can be used just like Stonehenge. Um, and it's uh, got a 5,000 year calendar. And I wrote the re main researcher, this guy was a genius. And ask him, I, I said, could it be plus or minus 200 years? Because the mind calendar is 51, 25, 5, And he goes, yes, it's plus or minus 200 years. He didn't really know. But that's kind of profound that we got this 5,000-year calendar out on the Canadian prairie that our indigenous people used. And they stopped using it about the time the white man came in. He figured that's when they stopped counting this calendar. But it can do more than just be a calendar, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then um, we get down into the time of like biblical figures like Abraham and, and we still have giants walking on the earth at that time. So what happened, I think kind of shortly after Rama is we were coming out of the golden age. We were in the uh, Tetra Yuga. So we were in the, the silver age, I guess you could call it. And we were heading into Dwarpa Yuga, starting to go down there. And I think that at some point there, maybe we go back into the fourth and the beings of whoever the Anunnaki were could come back in at that point. And all of a sudden we have giants on the earth at that point. You know, even in the Old Testament, they talk about giants walking on the earth. Um, there's stories about giants in Tibetan Buddhism. And if you were in Tibet and you ran into a monastery, I just saw a giant and funny, they wouldn't think you're crazy. They would just think you was somebody from Shambhala on the surface. And they wouldn't, you know, like it's in all of these different cultures about these tall beings that once lived here. 
and not all of them were bad. Um, I think, especially in the golden age, we're getting these blue skin ones that really, you know, they didn't leave us manuals for Vermanas or free energy machines or anything. The only thing they're sort of left us is spiritual teachings because we're spiritual beings in a physical body, but that's what it's all about. So any higher world cares more about the preservation of our planet and us becoming spiritual beings, enlightened beings. That's what this was all about. And so all these good races that come in the golden age and in the silver age seem to appear. They seem to be like helping us because there were, seems to be blue skinned people in the time of Krishna and Rama. And they kind of interlived with the, with, with people from India. They're in their history. Like they had different color skin and, and even um, Krishna's brother, Balram was different color than Krishna. So I don't, it's like, was there some DNA from one of these races put in there? Or, or I don't know. It, it's, you know, we'll never really know the answer. It doesn't matter. Um, and you ask, was all of this cosmology tied to these blue race beings? And, and I think the bigger picture was of this 24,000 year cycle, because we just didn't have enough. We haven't been measuring this close enough. Even the Aborigines, if they were had complete history of this, because they've been around this wheel four times now, they wouldn't be able to kind of break it down and know either. Uh, and, and see see these yuga cycles. So it had to come from somewhere else. I really believe that. And the fact they have vimanas that can fly um, between planets. And in these vimanas, they also mentioned the fuel types. One was called rasa and one was called quicksilver. And I think the rasa must have been for interplanetary flight and quicksilver because quick, you know, you want to get going quick when you're interplanetary. But the fuel types mentioned uh, and the rest of the teachings in this whole all of this isn't about free energy and or build your own Vimana at home. It's about enlightenment and about spiritualization. So we have to remember that as we go through the rest of this teaching, that that's really what they were teaching the, the higher beings. So I'm a little bit reluctant when you hear people channeling and they're saying that we're going to get money and Nestra funds and stuff like it doesn't make sense to me that a higher world would be offering that. Like one of our biggest problems on this planet is our, attachment to material things and the last can you imagine we all getting a 12 million dollars cash you know we're gonna have a you know a, a big um, frenzy of shopping and spending and we don't need that we need spirituality we don't really need more material things so i, I kind of if it was a higher race doing this i think they'd be telling us about enlightenment or something like that or how to be better spiritual beings not offering us cash and um you know beautiful twin flames and all that i've read everything so I'm just having a little dig at that, but just use your common sense, right? It's these higher worlds that seem to have appeared in our past. Uh, only focus has been enlightenment and higher consciousness and the good things. So, so as we, if you can see my, I keep losing my cursor, sorry, but um, you see this dark part on the bottom here? Yes. <laughs> so that's, that's the dark age. And we entered the dark age exactly in 700 BC and we exited in 1700 AD. So, so Shirak Tishwar, when he d made his measurement in 1894, he already knew that we'd left the Kali Yuga. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna break this down into some his historical events. And you can really see how our history fits exactly to this model. It's, it's kind of mind boggling. So we, as we enter the, the dark age about 700 BC, from this time to this time right here, which is really only 2400 years, so the Dark Age is quite a small period of these whole Yuga cycles. It's really one-fourth of, of the rest. It's, it's a 4 3 two, one ratio. And the total number of wars we've had in that period is 2014. So if you were counting World War I, which doesn't fall into this band, you, you wouldn't call, count all the campaigns. They just counted the wars. 2014 wars. Like You can sort of see why we, the divine feminine has to come back to planet Earth. That's just shocking, like, but that's, that's the dark age. So a lot of people, when you really um, see the genius of the Mayan astronomy and stuff, and they go, well, they started sacrificing. We were all doing crazy things in the dark age. Like in Europe, they were just barbaric. You know, it, nobody was really, we, all of us fell down in the dark age. And that's part of maybe spiritual evolution because when that soul goes into a physical body, um, you know, a couple lifetimes in a dark age like this, the spiritual growth is tremendous compared to what you would do if you were sitting on some fifth dimensional world, you know, all love and light all day. Like there, even the dark, there's growth in that 
that ugliness and uh, hopefully we've grown from it because um, we left in 1700. But then you remember I told you about this stanzas period. It's a 300 year period of overlap. And that's where this little line is right here. That's where the, the sort of the Kali Yuga and Dwarpa Yuga kind of merge. So you still, you, you still feel the effects. Um, and, and that's where World War I, World War II, your life, my life, we've all been in the, up until 2012, because I really believe on 2012, that's when we left this period. That's when we left. So we're fully into Dwarpa Yuga. And why you hear these, um, you know, these noises that people are hearing all over the world? Um, about a mile in the back of my property, I got a cedar forest. So I, I walk down there and kind of meditate and, and walk back every day. It's kind of my exercise. And in 2009, I walked down there. And you remember those people who were putting those sky trumpets on the internet? And some people are saying there were hoaxes. And I, of course, I don't have a cell phone. I've given up on technology. I've kind of went the other way. I'm kind of half off the grid in a way, I guess you could say. Um, so I didn't have, I couldn't record this thing, but I heard it and I was standing right there and it was right above my head and it was like it was coming from the sky, but the earth was shaking at the same time. And what's really happening is if you go over here and as we're leaving, we're coming out of the dark age. We went through this stanzas period, which is a 300 year period. And we left in 2012. So in, in Hindu cosmology, Virtue goes from 25% to 50% in, when you go from Dar the Kali Yuga to Dwar um, Dwarpa Yuga. But then when you go from Dwarpa Yuga to Tetra Yuga, it only goes to 75 and then it goes to 100%. So we've doubled our virtue, our, the energy, whatever, how these two suns interact has doubled. It's the biggest leap. Like we went, we've just went through the biggest kind of leap in consciousness and, 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 and in the, the change of the environment in 2012. So that's why we were hearing these weird, strange, strange noises coming out of the earth. That's why we're getting these weird weather patterns. Um, it's why the sun is starting to change probably over the last 20 years. Venus is brighter. The sun's brighter. A lot of people trying to say that that's not the case, but it's the case. Um, things are changing and, that, and that's what happens. And so on this, on this thing, we're over here now. But if you go back to this dark age where it starts in um, 7,000 BC, you start seeing all of these 2,000 wars appear. But right on 500 AD is when we were, the two suns were at the furthest point. And guess what you would think? Well, was there a big shift then? What really happened? Because you still got another 2,400 years of, or 1,200 years of the dark age going on the ups, on the ups arc, heading back to where the two suns start heading back towards each other. And what happens is um, the, the, these effects are, are what's really causing the change, why people are starting to look at this stuff and, and, and wondering what's going on, why everybody's feeling this change, is because we really are out of that. We're, virtue is at 50% now. Like We can do a lot of things now. Um, this is the time. This is the time for real spirituality, not fluff and all of these stories and this is the time for real, real human spirituality and, and having a little bit of hope and creating with more positive thoughts. Don't get caught up in all this doom and gloom, you know, because if you really believe this model, the two stars don't come back together again until 12,500 AD. We're 10,000 years away from Nibiru. So you might, you know, so all of these lens flares that you see on the internet every day, you know, I don't think we'll see that for another 10,000 years, but literally, Nibiru is, 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 if you believe this model, is 10,000 years away. That's a long time. And, and, and we, we're going to keep rising up and up. Every day gets better as you go into this model. And, and this is where the dimensional shift occurs. Is We're in the zone right now where I think we probably, and this is what people talk about ascension. There's really two types of ascension. There's individual ascension, which is you become an enlightened and that's when you actually shift your Buddha. There's a there's an ascension there. There's a pole shift, internal pole shift. When you that's an uh, individual ascension, a planetary ascension, I believe, is going to happen at some point in here where we go up a, a notch in, in our dimension. I don't think we go. Like a lot of people say we go right into the fifth. I don't think we get into the fifth and probably until we're right up into the Tetra Yuga when when we see that. So but nobody really knows. Nobody knows the date. Um, uh, that's a hard one, right? But the 
I think everybody can feel the effects now. And, and the reason why people are worried about Nibiru and it's in everybody's consciousness is it's been here before. It's caused problems before. And I think at the, at the conscious level, we're all kind of a little bit worried about it. And it's probably a brown dwarf or a red dwarf. So you're going to see it come in anyway. You're going to have ye a, at least a year if it came in before. It's not just going to go bang and be there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to make uh, a distinction, because I'm I'm even a bit a bit confused, a bit confused myself. So so we have a dual sun solar system, okay, yeah. and and they're at the poles. Let let's say they're at the poles of this great cycle, and then you're mentioning Nibiru as a brown dwarf. Uh, is the brown dwarf a third body, or is the brown no, dwarf the one brown of the dwarf. dual suns? It's or is the, the brown... dual sun. Oh, the brown dwarf is the dual sun. Is the dual sun, yeah. and is that just a sun that that didn't fully mature, or not you know, really, you know any, not, anything of its history, or what? Not really, but what I I know a little bit about brown dwarfs um, is they just haven't ignited fully. They still emit a tremendous amount of magnetics and electri electrics. It affects the electric universe. Um, some binaries might have two fully lit suns, um, but a lot of them would have brown dwarves probably and red dwarves, which, um, but as they would come into your solar system, by the time they were at Pluto, you'd actually see our sunlight from our sun reflecting off it. It's no, but when it's way out, you'd have to have infrared type technology to see it. And it's a pretty hard thing to find when it's 10,000 years out, right? So these Caltech researchers, they just inferred, they actually didn't find it, I don't think. They claim they didn't, but they know by this perturbations in these outer orbits of the outer planets that there's something out there. And, it, yeah. and it's, right. it's the size of, um, it's, um, the size of Neptune, so it's seven, Neptune's 17 times the size of Earth. So it's yeah. not a small body. And if it, if it is a brown dwarf or a, um, a red dwarf, it also has a whole lot of mass. It wouldn't right. be like a gas planet. It would have right. a whole lot of mass. And, and, and when the golden age happens and you have the two suns come together, yeah. let's say at the moment of, of close passage, uh, do you have any data on, on how close they come? What would that um, be like? Not, not really, Alfred. You'd have to look at all the different people who have modeled um, binary star systems. You can actually I go think. on the internet and see these models. Sometimes they, 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 they stay away from each other quite a bit. You know, they're perihelions like that. They don't come really close. They, and so the universe is an amazing thing. So it's designed not to totally wreck us because it, this see. planet's been going on for a long time, right? Like right. The, there's, yeah. but it probably helps give shifts in evolution and because there's creation, co-creation, and evolution kind of all happening. All, 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 all happening. Now, yeah. um, a couple of more quick questions. I, I'm just taking, I, I didn't want to break your flow, so I'm, I'm just coming in with, with these questions now. Yeah. Like, uh, sort of clear the deck on the Niburu issue. Just today, I got, and I, and I get these all, all the time, and you know, I, I'm in a few groups that are Planet X, Niburu's here, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and uh, I got it, an email from, uh, you know, Texas that said, oh, here it is. And here is the, um, they, here's a video from today, uh, May, May 23rd, 2017. And look at, Look at Nibiru. There it is in the sky. That's a second sun. Did so, you see? Did you see a sun and another object about a quarter of the size of the sun, kind of in perihelion? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Back to critical thinking. If if there was an object that big, that close, right now, where you'd see it yourself as soon as you went yeah. outside. But if if it really was there, um, the, yeah. you know, yeah, Mount Saint Helens, players. everything's every volcano is going off. Yeah. Um, there's there's tornadoes, there's floods, there's there's pole shifts coming. Yeah. Um, and it would come in fairly quickly though, because you know as they come together they speed up. If you look on a on a graph, binaries go like this: they speed up as they come in, and they slow up, and then they speed up. Um, you would have enough time to see it come in, and it's these these are lens flares, and um, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. So we'll probably keep seeing so, those. 
so a person like a person like Marshall Masters, who's kind of built an industry on, uh, you know, written books, has a, you know, a whole industry on there, and says I'm a government operative because I, even you know, I say you know, you and I are spewing disinformation now that. If that you're a, got a little ways to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what is well, going to open their eyes or do they have a vested interest or are they brainwashed or what? I, I think they have a vested interest and it's all back to that fear. Like, you know, I'm pretty seasoned on what's going on in the internet and we don't have to go at, through all of it, but I've seen it all, you know, Jupiter igniting the second sun. We're going to turn into a sun thousands and thousands of theories and, and and timelines changing every week, like we change, you know, like um, I think the writing of the of the ancient ones and the teachings of the wise ones is really coming to pass now, and we kind of need to look at a little bit more than that. We got we get a little bit carried away with channeling too, and everybody ha will have that potential or has that potential, but a lot of times they're channeling into the the, the lower astral. You got to be a really good channel, and so we're getting all kinds of disinformation and. And I'm not giving this to be a disinformation or spoil somebody's Nubiru doom because, you know, there's still hope that, you know, there's that 3,600 year orbit. Maybe we have a comet like object that only has a, because it's like a proton, an electron, these, these binaries, they can also have their own comets and their own things happening off, off, to the, off to the side. So, you know, like if they really want to have their doom, they can still focus on that. It's just, I see. I, I, I really see. believe that, yeah, and, and so there are all these theories. Oh, look at the Swiss uh, franc. You know, that's Nibiru. The, yeah. the Swiss just published Nibiru in their franc bill. That, so yeah. that's all part of the culture that, and sort of yeah. what you're saying. And there's also, you got to use your critical mind. This is, this is kind of out of, a, out of an ancient scripture. It could have been viewed the wrong way. We seem to get all our calendars mixed up. Um, we, we could be absolutely on the opposite side of this, and we reach the dark age when Nibiru comes in. You know what I mean? Like, it could be the opposite. Like this, the neat thing about this is, though, they have recognized that there is a dual sun, and it goes way, way back. Right. And it's the only thing that I can think of that would really affect consciousness in those sequences where you go through Satwa, Golden Age, um, Tetra Yuga. You know what I mean? Like, you yeah, don't get yeah, that repeating pattern unless you're in a binary there's an system. Organic, there's an organic uh, uh, continuity to this, and it's congruent, and it makes sense. And, and one yeah. son is called Saul, and the other son is called Nibiru. Yeah. And, and they're in this uh, uh, kind of an infinity pattern. And there's a finding that what most of the solar systems, what in our galaxy or in our universe, are dual suns. Well, um, what was the finding? I've heard seventy to eighty percent of all um, planetary systems in our galaxy are binary. So that would would assume that other um, galaxies are the same. I, and you I know, see. and we have hundreds of billions of galaxies, and they're all. Um, that's what's kind of interesting about this is that. When you see the interconnection between all the planets, how our consciousness is affected between two stars, well, there's other um, astrological events that cause, um, that affect con human consciousness. Yeah. And, and, and the ancients knew this. Yeah. Knew and, and one of the discoveries I made, I mean, for myself, in, in, in the book, The Omniverse, and readers are, you know, well, I mean, you can go there and check it out for yourselves is that a universe is a machine for developing souls. I mean, that's yes. one of its functions. And Absolutely. so there's a design criterion for universes and for galaxies. And that is that you want to maximize soul development. And as you pointed out, from a design point of view, it's very efficient to design yeah dual sun solar systems because they're a machine for their perpetual motion machine for constantly uh, evolving consciousness yeah evolving yeah. consciousness which evolves souls yes and so qed 
Now, let me ask you one final question, and then I'll, you know, you can go on, and I, and I, and I apologize to viewers. No, no, no. No, no, like no, this. no. This they, 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 they always say, Alfred, stop interrupting your guest. <laughs> but, yeah, so I promised. I, I don't mind. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. So we're, you're, you're talking about, and, and they've been around the wheel three times, you know, talking about different, yeah. different civilizations. So it occurred to me, what if we stood back and instead of using the wheel metaphor, substituted the spiral metaphor? And so what's the difference between the wheel metaphor and the spiral and, and the spiral metaphor? And that is that instead of going around in the same plane, somehow this thing is moving through. Uh, that's what ha that that's kind of what's happening because as as our solar system's doing its thing, and I and I showed you on the on the um I think that slide right there. Yeah. Um as our solar system's doing its, you know, there's bigger cycles within these cycles. Yeah. So we're moving with other star systems and our whole galaxy's moving within a, within a big motion. Everything's in this constant state of motion and it's, it's going up. Everything seems to be going up. So a spiral aspect is really what's happening. We're not just going to repeat. Like I said before, I think when we hit the dark age next time in, in thousands of years from now, that we're not going to fall back into a dark age where we're having wars and all of this horrible stuff we're going to hold the light eventually light the, the the whole universe is interconnected all these stars everything are interconnected by light the luminaries it's all about the light and the light always shines light on darkness and and that's what eventually happens so it is more like a spiral we're going up it's a spiral upwards we're not going down we're, we're going up and it might not seem like that at times just when you look at the external world but we really are like it's it's um, we're on the upward arc here on this side of the thing. We're right here. And if you look at this, you see the age of Pisces and the age of Aquarius because Western astronomers really don't know when that shift is going to happen either. Everybody's kind of in limbo right now, but these dates, they all line up. It's we're in the zone now. Like there's, there's going to be, um, it all, it's already occurred. Consciousness is, is rising very quickly now on this planet. And this is a sweet spot. This is the time to get things right, to um, you know, get that divine feminine back down on this planet. Because when we're in this dark age, when this, that's a very masculine, ugly period. You know, 2050, 14 wars, like that's just crazy. But right at 500 AD, right at the bottom, that's the exact end of the Roman Empire. That's when the Roman, 500 AD is when kind of the last days, it didn't really disappear, it just went underground, right? So when you get on this ups, upward swing of the dark age, this is where you have all the dark age in Europe, really from 500 to 1500 AD is where the dark age in Europe happened. And why I was going to say that this fits the model so well is right around 1700 AD, people like Voltaire and, and Europe, those type of guys started appearing and kind of saying, Hey, we've been kind of religious fanatics, uh, you know, cause the, the dark age, they were looking back and that's when the age of enlightenment happened. So the Age of Enlightenment in Europe actually started right when we left the Kali Yuga, exactly when Sri Yuktishwar said we left it in 1700. That's when the Age of Enlightenment started in Europe. And it wasn't the Age of Enlightenment that we're going to discuss about now. It was just people were thinking bigger. Uh, science wasn't getting so controlled by um, religion anymore. It was just, it was their first step, right? Like we all got to take baby steps. And, and so the European Age of Enlightenment from 1700 until about 1800, wasn't the age of enlightenment like we like to think, but things did change right on that date. And, and it ended right when we left the um, um, stanzas period, like 2000 is when we left, 2012 is roughly when, if you add 300 years from 1700, you get to year, year 2000. So this model fits our history and it fits our dark age when we, you know, our dark age actually fits this model's dark age. And, and more importantly, these three incarnations of Krishna which was Rama, Krishna, and Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all fit this model. They they all they all land in the right spot, and uh, so I think there really is something to this model. Um, and I'm not worried about Nibiru. You can worry about it if you want, but I really think it's it's um, but it's affecting our consciousness still. Like we went from 25 to 50 percent. 
that's a big jump. Like that's the biggest jump this planet will experience now for a long time. And so that's really kind of what went on. Yeah, yeah, 25 to 50 percent. What? Sorry. We uh, virtue goes in the dark oh, age. Oh, virtue right, is right. only at 25 percent in the um, Dwarpa Yuga, um, lower mental age. It's at 50 percent, and that's right. pretty profound. You know, like that's that's a pretty big jump. And remember this diagram where the yin and yang symbol, and I said that's really the two stars. Well, yeah. if you push these two dots right out to the out, you can see they're just right at the they're right at these tail end here. Um, if, if this sun moved out to here and that, so the electrics is different because there's a, you know, this magnetics and electrics are what's affecting consciousness. And as they move together, where you get a golden age, when they come in right close, you can see the force field around each one of those um, charged plasma spheres, which really what a sun is, is very powerful. And that's why a golden age happens. It's, it's the, probably when we jump into the fifth dimension and we, we actually go up in vibration or whatever you want to call it. And, and that's how these two suns inter interact, I believe. Now that's not in any scripture. So, you know, I'm just kind of, I really believe that that's, that's probably what's occurring just based on how I've um, heard about the golden age and Atlantis and stuff like that. So there's, so there's cycles within these cycles and some interesting things just between the Vedic and the Mayan calendar, because I really think the Mayan calendar was a subset of this Vedic calendar that um, the Mayan calendar starts at 3114 BC and ends in 2012. Krishna departed in 3112 BC, right? They had Vimanas. If you actually know um, the, about the Mayan civilization, it didn't start till four to 600 AD. So why did they have a calendar that goes back to 3104? BC and the reason was is I, I really believe somebody brought that information to them these blue races that flew bananas as crazy as it sounds I think they took spiritual information to groups all over the world and left them these these Stonehenge and Gleppy Teps and Omax and all these different uh, Nazca lines left them all these different sites so that they they, they could understand what they're for in the future it's you know, they didn't leave us plans for manas or free energy devices. It was always about spiritual things. So um, the Mayan calendar is a 5,125-year calendar. And right now we have the great year at 25,800 years. I think the 24,000 still could be very close because these, these dual suns, they speed up and they slow down. And um, we, 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 when we were calculating the precession the equinox with supercomputers, we didn't factor that in. So our scientists could be wrong. Another thing that most people forget to talk when they, they talked about, because most people are tired about the Mayan calendar because look at all the fluff that was generated around it and, and everybody just wants to brush it under the carpet now, but it was an important date. It marked when we left the stanzas period and went fully into Dwarpa Yuga. We're at 50% now. Maybe we're at 30 or 28%. We're at 50% now. Um, virtue so like that's why things are slowly going to get better I really believe that um, we have rulers and controllers that don't want that that's why that's kind of getting amped up that's why there's so much disinformation out there and so much fear and because once we get into a place of fear we really get into the wrong spot um, um, spiritually so but the mind calendar really remarked um, the return of Bolan Yokte Yokte and he comes from the sky, a white-skinned god from the sky. That's what their cosmology believed. Um, you know, is it a Vimana? Did Krishna fly a Vimana? Did they fly it there and give him this calendar? Because their calendar starts right around the same day Krishna ends. So if you apply the real mind calendar into the birth of Krishna, you get to 2424. Or sorry, 2024. Only seven years away. So if because I'm pretty sure the, the birth of Krishna was fairly accurate. They knew the, where the stars, the constellations were. So I think there's a connection there. I really do. And if you look at um, Christian cosmology, you know, Jesus, the guy comes back in the clouds, you know, like on a Vimana again. So there's a lot of interconnections between these different, um, the, these different um, groups. And uh, now they're flying deities of Shiva, Ganesh um, in Central and South America. Um, they found a tribe in Mexico that celebrates uh, Sita and Rama festivals. So why is some tribe in Mexico celebrating a Sita and Rama festival, right? 
Um, and then that guy um, that you interviewed a few years ago that was talking about that Buddha figure outside of LA, you know, um, that really is possible that these groups went all over and this stuff occurred and it goes back um, a lot longer. Even the um, um, uh, pyramids could be a lot older than they think. I think Stonehenge is older than they think because a lot of these were spiritual sites and they were reused for thousands of years. So we might go in there and carbon date something and say, oh, it's 3,500 years old. Well, that site was built 2,000 years old before that was carbon dated. Excuse me. And uh, that could have happened. I don't know. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of missing pieces to all of this, right? So this generation, the people now, the people watching this video, you know, we're the progeny for this next cycle. And it's a spiritual evolution, what it's really about. There's going to be great breakthroughs in science and all these other things, music, literature, everything probably. But it's more of a, of a spiritual um, step forward, not so much a technological step. Like a lot of people say that, you know, science and, and spirituality will eventually connect, right? Um, we're still kind of here where science doesn't recognize a lot of things that are spiritual um, because, you know, a lot of the etheric type things and stuff and multi-dimensions, it's, it kind of gets out of their realm really quickly it's where they can't measure it and they can't see it. So it's, you know, it's going to be a while, I think, yet before those two kind of come together. And um, they also say Krishna had to be here at the end of the Kali Yuga. And I really believe that Sri, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was... Um, an incarnation of Krishna. He came in the 1400s, not really not that long ago. So and, and sorry, who, what, for those of us, and I include myself, who are not familiar with uh, uh, who some who of the these Krishna people are. So, yeah, yeah. You, you know, so, some people may be familiar with Christ, the incarnation of Christ, but the Krishna. And you know, there's a close Krishna, um, and you got to be careful when you tell people this. But um, Krishna was a Das avatar, which means probably come from the great center, um, came from someplace very high. Um, some people call him the Juggernaut Guru. He's kind of the guru of the entire world system, even though there's other avatars that come in and stuff. He's kind of the main one, and, and in Hindu cosmology, he comes back at the end of the age as the Kelki avatar. And that's where the evils kind of removed everything clean. It's the exact same thing as Revelations is, is in, um, in the Hindu and the Tibetan sort of prophecies as well. Um, and it is believed, they're pretty sure that Rama was his, one of his past lives. And then there was Krishna and this guy, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which was an Indian sage. They believe, that, many believe that he was also um, an incarnation of Krishna. So he's appeared on the planet more than once. And so did Buddha. Buddha's, the Jakarta tales in Buddhism are really stories of all the Buddha's past lives that he remembered and kind of told people about. And they kind of, there's this little thing called Jakarta tales, which are really the stories of his past lives. So a lot of these people, after they become enlightened, they remember a lot of their past lives and they, and, and that's really what it is. That's what Krishna was. He was just, he's a, he, he, he's a, a guru and a teacher and, and, uh, and in one incarnation, well, the last Rama too. They had blue skin, so yeah. And and one hears about the Maitreya. How how does the Maitreya fit into all of this? Um, I think they're the same person. It's funny. This is next slide again. Oh, um, okay. Sorry. That's good. <laughs> that's good. Um, I think they're the same person. Uh, some people even call him Krishna or um, uh, Kalki Maitreya. It's I the same so. person. Because it's all the same guy. It's on a white horse. If you, if you look at Revelations, nobody knows his name. We all know his Jesus name, but this guy on the white horse, nobody knows his name. And I always thought, well, maybe it's another incarnation of um, Jesus, and they just don't know his new name or something like that. Um, but if you go into John 14, Jesus goes into this comforter, this guy that comes at the end of the age, and, and that he's the Holy Spirit. And I think that that's Krishna. I think that's the Kalki Avatar. And it's in the Gospels. Um, it's the same person. And when John had his vision about how he, he rides a white horse and he pulls his sword out of his mouth, you know, it's kind of strange. Why would a guy pull a sword out? If you're looking sideways, if you imagine somebody sitting on a horse, well, the sword in, in Vedic cosmology is called Ratnamaru. This is a, like a special sword. It's not just like a lightsaber. It sounds like it's even something different than that. 
and and it's worn across the front of him. So when he, if you were seeing him from the side view, which John might have in his vision, it looks like he pulls a sword out of his mouth, but he's really just pulling it out like that. And it's what's so crazy about this cosmology, you can't just look at Christian cosmology. They all tie together. They all have the exact same story. So we'll get into that now that we're we're in that point. Because I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time covering the um, sort of... Uh, um, eschatology of Buddhism, Hinduism, and Christianity. Oh, great, and, great. I, and, I'm sorry if I got you off, off track. No, I, 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 I like kind of open discussions like this. So the people incarnating now are really the sub-six root race. We're the sub-six root race. And it's not, a, it's not a skin color thing. It's all of us. We're all and, of us. And, and what does that mean, sub-six sub root race? Uh, well, uh, could you define that for us? Well, you know, we're entering a new cycle now, right? We, I've showed you on the way these dual suns were, we're really entering a new cycle. So this new cycle is the age of enlightenment. We're heading towards a golden age. We're in the stream of the golden age. Um, it, we, this is the next cycle. We, so our, our children are going to be really the foundation of the next, the gener for the next generation. Where the we're, we're, it's changing the the hope um, was it the Hopi or the Mayans? I think it's the Hopi called it the fifth sun. Um, the sun's changing as they start coming as we're on the ascending arc. These two suns are coming closer together. We've entered Dwarpa Yuga. It's, we've had a fifty percent jump from twenty five to fifty. That's kind of profound. Um, and so things are changing now. It's a, it's a new race. It's a new it's a new age. Um, some of this dark stuff is just going to fall away. Like I really believe things like archons and the dark spirits and all this, they can't exist when we're in the golden age. They literally, that they don't, they, they can't be here, but it changes. You get different groups coming in at different times. You get the blue guys seem to come in and the nice ones come in, in the golden age period. And then in the dark age, you sort of get these, cause we draw some of that in too. Maybe the multiverse works that way. When you go through a dark age, you draw some, you know, when you're negative and, and worried about things all the time and fearful all the time, you're helping draw that in. And that's part of this, all this doom stuff I think is really about is just to help everybody kind of be off, off center and not doing what we should be doing right now, which is kind of being happy and, and, and being a little bit more positive. Cause I think we really are, we're the change. We're not just the sub six root, six root race. We are the change agents. We are the foundation for this next this next cycle, and we got to do it right. We got to get it right, and and, and uh, start sweeping some of this junk away, and just focus on you know, focus on your own enlightenment, focus on making your communities better, changing governments, all that sort of stuff. That's where we need to be now, in in a positive sense, not angry and and full of dread and and stuff. Because you know, you read some of this stuff now, you'd be depressed all the time. It's like it's, it uh, doesn't have to be that way. So when I told you this 5,125 years minor cycle ended in 2012, the Kalki avatar is the last incarnation um, of Vishnu that comes at the end of the age. I don't know when this is going to happen. Um, if, if you count down all the Kalki kings that are li listed in Shambhala, because there's, depending on what research you do, there's 25 to 32 of these Kalki kings. Um, the 25th one's supposed to be the last one and each one has a ruling period of hundred years. So we're kind of getting into that 2,500 year period of these Kelpie King countdowns as well. So it could be, a, you know, some time in this shift, this could happen. And the Kelpie avatar and the guy in revelations on the white horse, I don't care what anybody says, they're the same person. Um, they both carry a sword. They both come at the end of the age. Um, um, it doesn't sound like they're really happy and like the, the guy on the white horse, his eyes are full of wrath and he makes war against all nations. Um, he sounds like he's kind of pissed off a little bit and who wouldn't be if you look at what's going on with governments and the way the world's run. Right. Um, so it, it has kind of a, a bit of a worrying kind of component to it. And in Tibetan, the lovely Tibetans who are very peaceful people in their, their sort of mythology, they call them the Rijin Jiepo, which is the same thing. It's the last Kalki king, rides out of Shambhala on a white horse, 
to defeat the dark the dark forces, um, carrying a meteor like like he's got the sword, all that sort of stuff. They're all the same. All of these cult, these different cultures have the exact same story, and it's kind of makes me wonder. I know sometimes like the Roman Empire pulled some stories out of. Uh, to, to kind of brighten up Jesus's story and, and they edited a few things, but I think he still really existed. The gospels the, of the Gnostic gospels and some of this other stuff had already got out before the Roman empire really came in. Like when I told you about origin, Adam Anius, he, he was like 185 AD, the way before Constantine. So that, that message was, already, there was some sage called Yeshua or whatever that had a message, had a great teaching and really impacted things. The Romans are kind of lazy though. They take some of these old teachings, maybe blend them with some of the other ones and, and put the fear in there and do all the stuff. But um, um, I think the underlying teaching was still there. Those Greek white writers they hired still had that, they had um, writings to work from. They just kind of edited things. So there's the, the gist of the stuff is still there if you, if you can read it that way. And, <clears throat> The world could not take another this 427,000 years of Kali Yuga because it just it just can't. If that was this, really the case, I'd be on here telling you know I wouldn't be doing this. Like, what's the point, right? It's um, but here's something out of the um, um, Srimad Bhagavatam um, at the conjunction of the two yugas, the Lord of Creation will take his birth as the Kalki incarnation. And become the son of Vishnu Yasa. That's a Brahmin and priest of Shambhala. Vishnu, that's, that's his father's name, I guess. At this time, the rulers of the earth will have degenerated into plunderers. Do you think we have to wait 427,000 years for the rulers of the earth to degenerate into to, to plunderers? That's now. You know what I mean? Like, And we're at the conjunction of the yugas right now. And we've got plunderers. I sometimes think some of these shelters and stuff you read about is really they're they're going down there to hide from what's coming like i uh, it's i think it's in our future but you can't really focus on that too much because then you start having this somebody's going to save me complex and that's we really have to be the change now like now we're in the right spot we're out of the kali yuga let's let's um let's be in the dwarpa yuga and act like we're in the dwarpa yuga now and as i mentioned this uh Vibishwat manu the celestial kings that have a 300 million year ruling period. So in the Vedas, they're not only tracking, you know, potentially 4.32 million year Maha Yugas, they're tracking these 300 million. And 14 Manus appear in one Kalpa. That's one breath of God. That's just a little speck of time, really. Like we think our time in 50, 100 years is just so long. Um, you know, and, and 14, so they're, they're watching these cycles and I really think it had to come from kind of off planet almost to be able to be able to watch that and be able to see these cycles because it's, it's too much. It's, it's, and I don't think it's made up, but it's our history fits with that cycle. I just showed you, you it, almost to the day, like 500 AD, we hit the bottom point and the Roman empire falls apart, but it didn't really fall apart. It just got more sneaky. It's, it's now underground and everything's, you know what I mean? It's just as much a Persian empire. If you really know the story behind all that, but it's kind of just more underground because consciousness slowly starts raising. You got to be more sneaky. Things have to be more, you know, smoke and mirrors. And that's where we're at right now is we really are in a smoke and mirrors sort of situation. And we're getting a lot of smoke and mirrors in the spiritual community too. So it's, um, it's, it's not just the external world. So you were asking about, they call them the four riders of the apocalypse but maybe it's the four riders of the epoch of the eclipse because the eclipse is what we're going to be talking about next. And the first one, and this is coming, I got this mainly from this Kriya Yoga sect I told you, and here is a Buddhist talking about Kriya Yoga, right? It's, it's kind of ironic. I, I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> I, I wrote a book on Zen Buddhism, and when I finished it, I didn't know if it was on Tibetan Buddhism or Kriya Yoga or Zen or whatever it was because it kind of had everything in it. But... Um, the current lineage holder of Sri Yukteswar's um, Kriya Yoga lineage in India is a, name by, a man by the name of Gurnoth. I hope I pronounced his name right. He's a living master. This is another one of these masters that are living right now. You know, you and I could go see one of his. He comes to North America quite a bit. Um, and um, he kind of gave me some of this, or gave everybody some of this information. And I kind of expanded on it, what I knew about the Buddhist side of things and all these other, you know, the Hopi and all these other prophecies, how they 
would it would fit into this? And he's saying that the first rider on the horse is this Kalki Krishna, who is Krishna in the past life, Kalki Avatar, but he's also called Maitreya. He's called Rijin Jeppo. And I believe he could be the same incarnation that King David was. And this sounds really crazy, but um, if you go into Ezekiel and stuff, it says in the Old Testament that David rises up as the shepherd at the end of times. I will rise up David. And I've even heard a Jewish rabbi come up with say that maybe it's an incarnation. He actually literally does rise from the dead. Kind of, you know, I believe that anyway, because it's, you know, the soul reincarnates. Um, and it's probably David because <clears throat> this guy's got to be kind of fearless too, right? And King, that's one of the great attributes of King David is that he was fearless. Now, a lot of people think that could be Jesus as well. And if it is, that means that Jesus was, was, was one, also an incarnation. That could very well be. The only reason I didn't put Jesus up there is <clears throat> because of what he says in John uh, 13, 14 or 14, 13. In John, he talks about this comforter that comes. And it's somebody separate to him. And he goes probably one of the biggest discourses in the um, New Testament about this guy, this rider on the white horse, this comforter, this guy that comes to teach all things. So probably the same guy. Now, the Hindu, the, the, the lineage in India, um, and this guy is also teaching Kriya Yoga. It's called Hamsa Yoga. So if you really want to do Kriya Yoga, make sure you're kind of tied into that lineage because that's the lineage. But he talks about this Vaivashwat Manu, and that's the existing world king. And the Manu is the same story as Noah in the, in the um, Hindu um, history. Uh, 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 built an ark, saved the world from a flood sort of thing. And I believe that that could also be an incarnation of the, of the Tibetan, um, um, the guy they call Panchen Lama. Because um, in Tibetan Buddhism, the Panchen Lama is seen as the, the, the world king of Shambhala. Like he has, he incarnates on the surface at times. And that's what this Panchen Lama is. And um, so the Panchen Lama in the, in the Galupa sect is potentially quite an important person. I think he's the same as this Manu, he just, you know, sometimes they're, they incarnate in Shambhala and sometimes they incarnate on the surface of the planet. And so there's a changing of a guard and that's kind of what was happening sort of post 2012, as they say that this world king passes the reins off to the next world king and the world teacher or Buddha, the fifth Buddha, passes the reins on to the sixth, which would be the sixth Buddha. And the sixth or the fifth Buddha is none other than the Lahari Maasai, which is this teacher of Shri Trishar, which got the Kriya Yoga from Babaji. See how the connections, there's some fairly big connections in all of this. And he was Bel Ram in a past life. Um, they say he was Abraham. I'm not just pulling these names out of hat. These are in their writings. They talk about this and who they were and stuff. They kind of try to downplay it because it would freak out people. You know, you don't go around and say I was Moses in a past life, you know, like that that freaks a lot of people out. And then the next world king is um, Shri Tishra himself. He's going to incarnate again, and he'll be the next world king. Now, people often think, well, that sounds a lot of, we're supposed to have the divine feminine, and we're talking about a bunch of men again, right? And the thing is, is that they have spiritual wives. Like when Rama came, there was Sita. When Krishna came, there was Radha. When Jesus came, there was Mary. Um, there's a counterpart, I believe, when these guys appear that will be, kind of their equal and, and it'll be obviously a female and um and and these were all avatars they've all been here before they've had many many lifetimes here like we wouldn't even be able to count them all sometimes they're no, well known sometimes they may not be known at all in that lifetime like think of how many aborigines in australia or natives in america that have probably become enlightened and were like sages in their own right but they never wrote anything down they just kind of passed with time and we never heard about them, right? But they were their their understanding was still just as profound as you know potentially any one of these peoples. Um, that's happened, and and they come from the great center. That's what an avatar is: is an avatar descends from a higher world to come down to help a lower one like this get unstuck. But they don't remember their past lives. So if something happens to them, they a lot of that gets scrubbed. They don't remember them until later on in their life. Um, some people have lots of glimpses of past lives. You don't have to be enlightened to remember that. Um, it comes more after enlightenment, I believe. 
And they said there was 12 of them that came, 12 men and, and 21 women, 33. So that's where that number 33 comes from all the time. And an interesting thing is if you look at the 12 men and these 21 women in um, Tibetan Buddhism, which really um, the Vajra stuff that was tied to Atisha, he talks about 21 Taras, which are 21 female Buddhas. These are these 21 women these, that are going to anchor, I believe, will appear. They, some of them might already be here um, that are going to help anchor the divine feminine because I put this here, women are going to save the world. Like That sounds crazy, but you know that whole dark age and all those wars, that, like, a lot of that was men. And even a lot of women have to behave better too and, and kind of get more spiritual and stuff. But I really believe that women are going to be the great change agents on this planet. I just, it's in my soul. I just know it. It, it has to be. We're, we've been too masculine. When we get into that dark age, things just got too masculine, too many wars, you know, this macho stuff and these, this aggressive and women have to take the role in changing this planet. That's just, that's, you know, it's uh a lot of men have to spend some time healing and kind of letting go of that, you know, becoming a bit softer, I guess. It's kind of hard to be a man in the modern world right now. But um, so these, these Taras are female Buddhas and they're revered in Tibetan Buddhism and they have them in their past. And the good news is, is, and I don't know if this next cycle, but Shakyamuni predicted there's going to be a thousand Buddhas in the next cycle. So we've only had four and there's only going to be five in the last one. In the next one, there's going to be um, a thousand. And that's pretty profound because if the next cycle is really just this 24,000 year cycle, that means every 24 years, we're going to get a new Buddha on the planet. There's going to be a new Buddha. Like m people don't really realize that's pretty profound to have basically every 24 years, another Buddha. Does, you know, see what I mean? Like it's, I think our future's okay. I really do. Um, and, and so this is what, why I talked about some of these past avatars and just to give people an idea of what, who these people might have been and what their purpose was. And some of, there is a connection to actual politics. But now we're going to talk about the avthut. Now it sounds a little lesser, but an adhut is the same as an avatar. So if you can see an avatar descending into a planet like this, well, you know, all those Denisovans and, and all of our history of all the people on this planet. There's been some souls down here on planet Earth for a very, very long time. And they're great souls. They're great beings. And they're av avhut. And they're going to rise up. See, when the avhut and the avtar are at the same level, there's no difference. They're the same now. And that's what this is all about. That's what... Uh, evolution of consciousness about that's why some binary star systems might have been created is there's a leveling when an avatar or an avatar reaches the level of an avatar there's no difference and i think we have examples of adhut right now and i'll give you one um his name was kien kiensu ripinchi he's passed now they found his reincarnation but i've never read any of his teachings other than he tried to link the um, um, one of the uh, Tibetan mantras, Om now uh, Padme, um, to a complete teaching. That's all I've ever read of this guy's teachings. I've never seen him. I've never met one of his students. All I've seen is through about 30 second video clip on YouTube of this guy, and they wheel him out on this big platform. And you don't have to read his teachings. You know, you can just see it. That man is an avtut, I believe, or he could be an avatar because he's is so much divinity in this man that I don't. If any student that got to sit at his feet was like sitting with Shakyamuni Buddha, there's no difference. They're they're the same. The Buddha comes down from a perfect state of Buddhi to come into a planetary system. The avtut rises up, and in some ways, the avtut might even be greater because they've come from muck and chaos and all the rubbish that's come onto this earth. And they've risen to the same level. And you can just see it. Just, just do it for your own fun, Alfred. His name is Kienzo Ripinche. Um, get your partner to watch it too. And you'll just chuckle. That's all you can do. You'll just see this, this incredible being. And that's kind of what this is about. This is about um, waking up the Advoots. It's time for the Advoots, all, all our Earth brothers and sisters, to wake up to their own nature. Because... Um, you know, that's what we're here for, right? That's what it's about. 
so now I want to talk about, um, I don't know where I'm at in my slide presentation. Okay. So this is where it gets a little bit difficult because now we're going to start talking about um, the soul, the spirit, the Buddha nature. It doesn't matter if you call it God spark. I like your term. Another great term you came, you came with a holographic God fragment. Like that's brilliant. Like, can I use that if I ever write a book? Another oh, totally. book? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's totally, it's, 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 you know, cosmic it, physics. <laughs> it's cosmic. Okay, great. Um, holographic God fragment. That's a good one. Um, God spark, Atma, Buddha nature, original nature, your authentic nature, your soul, your spirit. Um, we've got all kinds of names for it, right? But you can't see it, you know, and it's kind of a thing that we all know we have it. We all know you hear about stories of people die in, in a hospital bed and they float above and they can look down at themselves and um, near death experiences. Um, this is something that is kind of personal, but I'll share it with the viewers. About two years ago, so this teaching that we're giving right now, I wrote most of this presentation for you about, was it six or seven years ago when I first contacted you, right? Right. And, and, I, and I pulled back. Now, and I said, it's just not the time. And I don't know if you got mad. I hope you didn't get mad, but it just wasn't no, time. I, 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 I wasn't mad. Oh, I didn't think all. you were good. Yeah. yeah I mean, but it, it the, just the couldn't reason, happen. Yeah. The, the, the reason I pulled back on some of it is because after somebody experiences enlightenment, you, everybody's heard about it, the, what's called the dark night of the soul, like Jesus went through it when he was out in the desert. Um, Buddha was tempted by three daughters of Mara, which is the three daughters of the devil. And after he's awakening, you hear about these kind of, they go, you go, it's only a brief period, but it can be quite dark. And I think what's happened in the past, these people all became enlightened in the Kali Yuga, right? In the dark period, the dark age. So there's more archonic forces, more negative forces. So when a new bright light emerges on the planet, it's easy to find and the darkness kind of tries to throw them off, right? And I think um, Jerry told me that she's done research into this. And that kind of pulled me back a bit too, because it's, it's important when you do these final teachings, the, some of these teachings I'm going to give you today, haven't been sharing with people for a very long time, like 2,500 years, if, if my, wow. my estimate is right. And I think the reason Buddha didn't openly give this teaching, and I know that he knew this, I don't have a scripture. I didn't dig up some scripture in my backyard. Um, no aliens have landed in my backyard and told me all this. Um, I know this from experience. I know this, what I'm going about to teach. I know and then I back engineered it trying to figure out, is this in our history? And it, it was everywhere in our history. And it was right in front of our faces the whole time. But dark age, we kind of miss it, right? And modern TV. And we're just not, we're not looking at these things like we should be. So I didn't want to give this teaching. I thought this is, I'm going to just write a book, get enough copies of this book will get out there. And in time, somebody in long in the future, probably long after I'm gone, somebody is going to, read this and really realize what was said and, and, and I've done my part, right? Kind of, yeah, I'm done. Cause I worried about these newly enlightened people. Like monks don't give some of these higher teachings out. And I think the Tibetans and the Taoists know some of these elements. They don't give higher teachings out until the students really ready. So you can actually potentially do it too soon. Your spiritual foundation might not be right. I worried about all that stuff. So I kind of sat on it. About two years ago, I was um, walking around in my yard and this like voice came in my head, you need to go to the hospital. You need to go to the hospital. You need to go to the hospital. In my head, it was my dad who'd been deceased for three years. It wasn't like I could hear my dad's voice. I could see my dad's thoughts. It was in my head. So I, I felt fine. Nothing was wrong. I had kind of a sore back and didn't think anything of it. And then this kept happening though. So, I'm a bit of a spiritual person. I'm going to go to the hospital because this is, so I even fed the two extra bales to my horses and brought all my pets in and fed them like for a long time. I get to the hospital, they test my blood and they go, well, you haven't had a heart attack, but we're going to make you sit here and for a few hours. And so I'm sitting there waiting and I have a massive blood clot going to my heart and I die instantly mm -hmm. and I'm not on machines or anything. So they didn't find me right away. So I'm like laying there and off to the bedroom in an emergency with no machine, so it might have been five minutes that I had been dead for. 
And my death was different. I didn't like, you know, I didn't look back down at my body because I've done this before. I've read the um, Tibetan book of the living and the dead. I, I went past the Bardo. I didn't get caught in that tunnel of light like most people do. I was off. I was, I was gone. I was out of here. And I, I traveled a long ways. If this was only four minutes, three minutes, I don't know how long I was actually clinically dead for. And like my heart completely, they barely got me going again. Like it's surprising that I'm even sitting here right now giving you this presentation. And um, I get to almost, I guess you could call back to heaven or wherever I was going. And this voice came out and says, you got to go back and teach. That's what I was told. You got to go back and teach. And just as that happened, you know, when they hit you with the things and you, and they shock you in the hospital, all I can remember is sitting up and I was back in my body and I looked around and I could see that they had these paddles on me. And I, the first thing that came, cause I was back on earth now was all oh, my horses, my dogs. I started worrying about all these earthly things again. And then I thought I'm not going home tonight and fell back into the bed and didn't wake up until after I would been through an emergency and, and uh, hours later. So I thought, well, I got permission to teach this now. <laughs> that was my message. Like I died, went to another side and said, and this is the only thing I know how to, what to teach. I didn't have, you know, I could teach knitting or, you know, like I don't think that was what I was supposed to teach. And, and it was this. So that's why I contacted you again. So I've been kind of sitting on this. But the reason I gave people this story is before you start doing these practices and understanding this, um, take your time build your spiritual foundation you can't have a lot of drama in your life you can't if your mind's still racing and you're still chasing after material thing you know don't do any of this you, you've got to slow down and and do things the right way build your spiritual foundation before you do some of these later practices because literally what i'm going to teach you can take decades maybe lifetimes off of somebody from awakening to their own consciousness they really can it's and it was known in our past it was known a long time ago so that's kind of why I've been holding off on this for so long. Amazing. Yeah. For me, it was kind of uh, at, at my end, I knew that there was something that was just preventing our getting together yeah. to film this so that it could be released. And then all of a sudden, It happened and we've released part one and now yeah. we're releasing part two. And uh, I couldn't tell you, you know, all I know is that all of a sudden it just happened and, yeah. <laughs> and we couldn't make it happen before. Yeah. And, and it was at that le level on my end, it was an impossibility to make it happen and release it. That's, I was prevented by a force from recording it and releasing it. And now it's happening. Yeah. yeah. And you know what it really is, is this was before 2012 when we first started talking. Yeah. So I think we had to go through that date, had to kind of go through some of this stuff. You know, I, I just think it's just, it's timing. It's just sort of kind yeah. of cause, one of those cosmic, cosmic timing of things. So what this is really about is about everybody watching this. This is about, it's about people and, and about awaken to your own nature. And what is your own nature? So we all talk about these orbs now that are appearing in digital photography. Have you seen these before? 